It's nice to see everyone up and uh, up and about this early. Um, yeah, so this is um, Mike Turner talking about the Orbs game. Give a nice round of applause to Mike. Hello. So um, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the Orbs kicking around the, uh, the site. Um, so I thought, explain exactly what was going on for those interested. Uh, the, the idea started um, last uh, EMF camp, and it's kind of, I pinched a bit of ingress, really, um, so for those that know it. Um, and I thought, what can we do that's kind of a little bit EMF-like? Uh, and that's what I came up with. Um, so the first thought was, how viable is it? Because obviously, I've got to make a lot of these things, so they've got to be cheap. Um, so I found Wi-Fi modules, ESP8266 is very cheap. RFID reader is very cheap. I could get PCBs made cheap, it was really good. Um, so I thought, I, I could do this for under a tenner. I'm sure I can, I'm sure I can. Um, so that's what I thought I needed. Um, that's what I actually needed to put in them. Um, things like power regulation didn't really cross my mind until I was actually trying to design it. Um, so the final cost was actually 14.50 an orb, um, very roughly. Uh, that's excluding all the bits that went wrong that ended in the bin. Um, so um, that's kind of the prototype that I was working with. Um, and uh, yes, it worked at home. That was, it was viable. Um, would it work in EMF camp? I had no way of knowing or testing. So uh, I thought, yeah, let's go for it. So um, this is uh, one of the boards that's in the orb. Uh, and at the top, you can see the ESP module. Um, now, I was warned by Charles uh, in tw from 2016 when he did stuff with ESP modules, they don't work very well if they use the integrated antennas at EMF camp. He was getting a range of like a few meters from each of the base stations, so, he's, so I used proper antennas, which is why you see this aerial sticking out the top of all of them, is to guarantee that it can actually get decent communications. Um, the uh, PIC chip below it in black, um, that it was selected because uh, they can be very low power. Uh, the ESP modules are quite power hungry when they're, they're running. Um, and I needed something that could just wake up, check for an RFID card and go back to sleep again. So uh, I picked one of them. Um, the one that's, uh, that's on there is the 16F15345. Um, it's, it's just a generic, it runs at 32 megahertz. It can do all sorts of th stuff. So it was ideal for that, but it will go to sleep and it will draw almost nothing. Um, so the, 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 the boards, when they're asleep, draw about two and a half milliamps in total across the whole thing. Um, when they're awake, uh, they draw about five milliamps, including the pick. And then the RFID reader, um, it, uh, it draws about just under 30 milliamps uh, when it's active. The Wi-Fi module is about 70. So uh, you can see, add, adding all together, I, I couldn't afford to have the Wi-Fi module on very much. So. Um, these, these um, RFID card modules that you buy from China, they're cheap. They're like £1.10 on eBay. Uh, the problem I found was that they had a read distance of about two centimetres um, and could only read a MyFair Classic. And I was desperately trying to work out why, because everything said it should read more. Um, my initial thought was, ah, it's a fake chip on there. So I bought some genuine ones, swapped the chips over, and it had the same problem. Um, but eventually I managed to find somebody who posted an article in a, um, on a forum, and he'd, revert, he'd actually looked at the specs that they'd used, and if you look down the bottom left corner, um, where the arrow is pointing, um, there's two inductors, and those inductors were underrated on all the boards coming from China. So I swapped those um, for 155 milliamp uh, parts and suddenly it could read my Barclay card, my Santander card, it could read anything I threw at it basically. Um, so uh, it, for those interested, if you're going to do anything with these, these RFID boards, I think the number there, the 1826601, that is the uh, RS components part number that I use to replace these to actually make them work. Um, so if anybody's having a play around with that, it's well worth a look. Um, so the way this, this particular bit worked was uh, the, the PIC chip would turn on the RFID card reader for a, as short a time as possible, enough that it could then check for a card, turn that off, flash an LED uh, to show the team is owning it, and go back to, sl go back to sleep. 
And then the moment somebody interacted with it, it would read the, read the card ID, power up the um, ESP module, which it would then communicate with, send the card details to that, and that would then send all the, uh, the details off to, um, off to the, the main server. Um, the PIC chip, I wrote the software in a thing called uh, Proton Basic, which is uh, a compiler that I, I've used for PICs for many years. Um, it's pretty straightforward to use, so that's why I use it. Um, on the uh, Wi-Fi module, I actually used uh, MicroPython. So that's got a MicroPython script that, uh, that listens on the serial port to commands coming in from the PIC, and it responds and sends the responses back. Um, just because I know where I'm at, when I wrote the uh, communications, all of the comms coming in and out of the orb are signed with the SHA-256 uh, signature to make sure that they're coming from the, right, uh, from, from the server and from the orb. Um, so nobody could uh, game it in that way, hopefully. Uh, oh, I forgot I zoomed in on this. Um, just a rough thing, the, the, the black little components across the middle are uh, MOSFETs for turning the LEDs on and off. And just below that on the left where the power leads come in, that's the power circuit to regulate it to 3.3 volts. Um, incidentally, if anybody's scared about doing a surface mount, um, I thoroughly recommend just get a 30 pound air gun and, uh, and spend 15 quid on some uh, um, solder paste. It's actually really, really easy. Um, I had somebody doing it who's never soldered before in their life within sort of 10 minutes they were soldering boards, so it's the really, really straightforward. Um, so yeah, that was the zoom in on that one. So the way it works, so um, there's a Raspberry Pi, the one at the bottom, uh, it's got a battery backup just in case, because I know I was gonna unplug it at some point by accident. Um, uh, that's currently in my tent, and everybody's been avoiding kicking it and moving it around if possible. Um, the orbs and the scoreboard all communicate back to that server via MQTT, and it's just a case of they subscribe to um, certain uh, message chains and uh, certain topics, sorry, and uh, it's, so when you capture an orb, it will go through, it will send a token, which is so orb from, then the MAC address. Um, that presented an interesting problem when two of my Wi-Fi modules had the same MAC address. So. <laughs> So, so, and then um, the, the, the line below it is the, um, the message content. So you've got the, uh, the token ID of the user, then you've got a, a message ID number. So the message IDs increase every time. Again, that's stop, to stop replay attack. And then after you've got the SHA-256 hash of the message and the topic. Um, and then you've got a list of the different kinds of messages that would be sent and received between the orbs and the server um, to allow people to register, to allow people to uh, you know, check it, who owns the orb, that sort of thing. Um, the back end, so I said, it's Raspberry Pi. It's running Python, uh, a Python script, uh, and all the data is stored in a tiny DB, which is basically just a JSON file. Um, I did that just because it was quick and easy, and I, it worked. Um, I wasn't sure how scalable it was, but I thought, well, this is a way of testing it. Um, the scoreboard runs Pygame, um, which is pretty straightforward. If anybody wants to do some simple graphics, you can get some pretty good refresh rates on it, um, providing you don't use high, high uh, like complexity JPEGs and so on. Um, so I used BMPs, and it worked really well. Um, and that allowed it to draw that, that scoreboard screen. As hopefully, you've all seen that one. So yeah, the build. Um, building 40 of these things was interesting. Um, so, yeah, it was quite chaotic at times. Uh, boards everywhere, people soldering, um, lots and lots of stuff. There's a lot of experimentation as well while I was building some of these things. You can see the, the, the remains of that kicking around in the uh, top right corner. Um, and when you say you're going to build 40 and then you see 40, you realize what a, a mammoth task you actually have in your hands. Um, the orbs themselves were just um, uh, sort of hobby or uh, ball, ball balls that you could buy. I sprayed them uh, with uh, frosting, uh, so just to give that frosted effect. I also discovered ways not to draw holes in them. I went through quite a few that way. Um, you can also see there was a, there was, there was a couple of uh, mistakes I made. Um, 
when I was designing these, because I was in a rush, uh, and they ended up getting sent to production uh, a little bit early, and then realizing that all the LEDs that I'd bought were rated at 3.3 volts, which is ideal for my circuit, but I put uh, space for resistors to go in on all of the LEDs, uh, and so we had to wire link um, a load. <laughs> so um, a few people helped, Nick, Dan, Yesin and Patrick all, all helped out uh, getting it across the line. Um, so I really appreciate uh, all the, uh, the effort they put into that. Um, I wouldn't have done it on my own. Um, one of the things that did come up, um, I ordered things rather late. Um, I say late, sort of about six weeks out. One of the problems was that uh, the batteries that I'd designed, decided to use suddenly went out of stock as I went to order them. Um, so I ended up having to buy them from elsewhere. And I actually bought them from um, a company in the Netherlands and they've got 18650 cells which are inside the orbs. Um, I was originally going to use this particular one, two, two, uh, two amp hour uh, batteries. I got this email, as you can see, a week before EMF camp to say they were back in stock after I just bought a load from somewhere else. Uh, it's always the way. Um, yeah, so. Things that I would change, read the LED ratings would probably be a good start uh, before I design a board. Uh, the cheap connectors, some of the boards are struggling to uh, read, and that's mostly because the, uh, the headers on the board were just cheap ones. They're not making very good contact, and there's not much I could do about it um, at that stage. Um, yeah, so order the parts sooner is really the answer. Um, build it sooner. Yeah, yeah, we all know we're going to uh, not do that next time. Um, and yeah, maybe use something that stays together because they kept falling apart. I had to use stickers to actually hold them together, if anybody noticed. Um, and what, there was one little thing that I did notice when I was um, remoting onto the, the Raspberry Pis, and that was, uh, for some reason, the last login was from jontysbeard-nightstand.gchq.org.uk. No idea what that was about. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Um, have we got time for Q&A? Uh, plenty of time, yeah. Okay, cool. Anybody got any questions? Um, you said that um, the RFID chip uh, could only read a certain kind of um, RFID, and then, and then you upgraded it to one that could read any RFID, is that right? So the, the board as standard was constrained by power. So the, the inductors that they supplied with it were rated about 7 milliamps. And the chip can output 150 milliamps onto the radio circuit. So what was happening was um, it couldn't deliver enough power out of the, the board to then energize the RFID cards. So as a result, only cards that needed very little power, like the MyFair Classics, would actually power up. The more modern ones, like, um, like a, a, a Desfire EV, just wouldn't turn on at all. Um, like my, my old Oyster card would read, but none of my bank cards, my Tesco club card, I couldn't get anything to, else to read with it. I swapped those inductors over, and the same piece of code then read ev all of the cards. Um, so yeah. Including my bank credit cards, and people have been playing with their bank cards, by the way. <laughs> any more I am honestly not t taking any of those details. I read the UID and that's it. <laughs> any more questions? Oh, there's a, there's a hand up at the back on the right. Do, 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 do. Going to the back. Is it you? Is it you? Okay. Um, I was wondering what interesting statistics. Oh dear. I was wondering what interesting statistics or data you might have seen come in, um, or anything you might have learned from people playing a game that was not expected to you. Um, people did detect some of the stuff that I left in the game, like speeding captures up by leaving your card underneath. Um, so there's a little, couple of little quirks I deliberately left in the game. The defending the orb as well, people figured, that, I, I think I put some stuff about that, but people were actively defending their orbs and so on. Um, I haven't looked at any stats yet. Um, but the game does log an awful lot of information about what's going on. So if you look at the scoreboard, it's flicking through a bunch of different personal stats. Um, there's actually more captured. Um, there is a log file recording everybody's time of visit to every orb. So 
the one of the things I wanted to do, but I ran out of time, um, was that I wanted to be able to draw a map of everyone's visit around the camp for the for the weekend. Um, so the data's there, but there's no EMF camp coming up for me to quickly rush to write that bit of code. So I don't know whether I'll get around to it. But uh, what I'll probably do is I'll I'll put the data out there if anybody wants to uh, to have a hack around with it. Um, I mean, it's just a there's a text file and a JSON file, and they contain all the data from the game. So, only UIDs, of course. Anyone else? Any more questions? Oh, there is definitely one at the back this time. Are you planning to do this again next year, and do you have any ideas how you might evolve the game in that time? I say next year, two years' time. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of development time, isn't there? Um, so, first of all, I want to make them more reliable and not fall apart. Those are two kind of quite important things. Um, evolving the game, I, I'd have to ask for ideas on that one. I, would, I do want to put some puzzles in the game. So I wanted to do some things where you have to visit certain sequences to unlock certain stuff. Um, so you have to, for example, if I can plan it well enough in advance, you have to write out a certain symbol or letter, and then you, your team will get a bonus point, and it would come up that you've unlocked something on the scoreboard. Um, I also wanted to, and again, there's, there's a few things. Like I wanted to add a badge app where you could register and set your name. Um, website that didn't happen. <laughs> there's, a, there's a number of bits that, that just haven't happened that I need to make happen. So you can set your name and, and register. For anybody interested, you can just read your RFID card on a mobile phone, look at the UID, and figure out which, which player is you on the screen. Um, but yeah, those are things I'd like to do. Oh, and team names. Red, green, and blue is a bit boring. Oh, I, I mean, I'll put it out for people to vote on it. So it, we're boating the boat face, whatever people come up with. There we go. If you've got ideas, please let me know. Um, oh, and one thing before I forget, um, I have set up a, a GitHub repository, which I will be uploading to. At the moment, it's empty. Um, but it is, uh, if you just search for Orbs game, then you will find it on, on GitHub. Any more questions? Nope. OK. All right, thank you, Mike. Thanks.